please turn to your neighbour, welcome each other. It's good to be here on a Friday evening. Amen. I pray you had a good week. You're blessed. Amen. We've been blessed. We're here so we've survived the week and challenges. The fact that we're still standing is a testament that God is still in control and still in authority. Praise the Lord. Amen. God bless you. Just before, with no further ado, let's just come into today's Bible study, this evening's Bible study. I want to encourage you to trust in God. On Sunday, I'm giving a message that's going to be a game changer in relation to perception of God and uh, the church's role in the world. It's going to be a, a game changer, a profound game changer, with the, the way God is revealing himself into the world, through the church into the world. So if you cannot be here, please tune in. And people watching live stream, it's very important. Changes everything. The dimensions, our outlook is transformed and will be transformed if we dare to do so, to trust in God's mechanisms and God's process. Praise the Lord. And so lay foundation for Sunday's message. I want to touch on the theme tonight, the subject on faith. Amen. Amen. Faith. It's important that we believe and it's important what we believe. People exercise faith every day. You know, people in business, uh, people in, in what to achieve things, goals in life, they put their trust, faith in the outcome. And in fact, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, this is what the Hebrew writer wrote. And I wanted to think about the words that we are sharing. He says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Meaning you're driven by the expected outcome. I want to say that again. You're driven. Faith is, is, the, is the fuel that drives you towards your expected outcome, even though it hasn't taken place. But your faith would, is, is, is the fuel that will empower you to get you to where you believe you need to be. Amen. And this is, ex faith is, is exercised every day. Praise God. You believe if you're, if, you're, if you're taking public transport, you believe that the driver of the bus is going to get you to your destination. You don't get on the bus doubting it's not going to. You trust the, the, the ability, the qualification of the driver. You get on an aeroplane, more than not, you may be fearful sometimes, flying mile high, but you trust the qualification, the ability of someone else. You put your trust in someone else. And depending on their, if they've done their, 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 their uh, examinations and their, and, and their preparation correctly, perhaps more than not we get there. And I pray we will always get there. But it's not always the case. Some people put their trust in other people and it's fatal. We saw recently the, the billionaires got into a little makeshift little submarine to dive the depths of where they saw the wreck. They became a wreck trying to find the wreck. But they put their trust in someone else. And they paid a great amount, a great price, $250,000 to experiment with their mortality. That $250,000 each. And the, the word of God, God is saying, put your trust in me. I have a 100% track record, and this is what we're going to explore on Sunday, which is a game changer. And let's be serious about our faith. If we want to trust God, I'm saying to people out there, you want to trust God, you want to change your life, believe in God, trust God. And I want to show you some, some principles today to apply in your life to have that outcome, because we want the outcome, but we hold back from putting the, the, the principles in their place to bring us into that outcome. We neglect certain things, and when we have a spiritual uh, bankruptcy or a, a spiritual wreck, shipwreck, we say, what happened? What happened was I didn't put the necessary things in place to allow that process to take place, to take me where I needed to be. We read the Bible, but we don't live according to the Bible. We live according to our into narrative, what we think, uh, what, what God can do and cannot do, and we step aside, we speak about faith, but we don't live by faith. We want guarantees. Paul says, you walk by faith and not by sight. I mean, that's trusting. 
Praise God. And I wanted to explore this subject on faith because I'm laying the foundation for, for Sunday. Because if you grasp the, what God, the profound revelation of God, you, it, it, it resolves everything in your relation with God. You'll be unshakable in your faith. You stand firm in spite of what's happening around the world. The Israelites were in Goshen in Egypt. There was light in where they were, but there was darkness all around. But they were still in slavery, but they were in Goshen and there was light. They were in slavery, but there was light around their lives. The word Goshen means to draw close, and we need to draw close to God, and that's where the light is. He says, I am the light of the world. He's the light of life. Praise God. So we need to draw close to him in spite where we are. I, 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 our, geog- our geography doesn't, it, it's not important in relation to God. It's not how, how, how scenic it looks. Because when, when, when uh, Lot uh, f- went with Abraham, Abraham and, and, and there was squabbling, and there was conflict between the herdsmen and their people. And Moses, uh, Abraham said, Abraham said, you go your way, I go my way. And he allowed him to choose what he felt was the best place for him. And he looked out and he saw the best plane, the fruitful plane that he saw in the natural, and he chose that. And, and by default, Abraham, Abraham took the, the other direction. But who was blessed at the end? It was Abraham. Lot became a prisoner. And Abraham was always free and empowered and at the presence of God. So let's take this journey for those, and I thank God for your coming here this evening, taking the time to be here to receive the message of God, which is empowerment. Because there's no, there's no other alternative. Like, it's either God or nothing, really. The world has nothing to offer us. And so it says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So your life is the evidence in relation to what you believe. And then in verse 6, this is what our Hebrew writer writes, he says, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is the reward of those who diligently seek him. So without faith, it's impossible to please God. If you're just going through the motion, but there's no substance of faith in your heart, really reaching out through the hands of faith to touch the hem of his garment, it's for no avail. It means nothing. It's, it's meaningless. The woman with the issue of blood, she, there, was, there was something in her that believed that if she just touched the hem of his garment, something will happen. She believed. And her belief made it a reality. I praise God. Because she moved by verse 1. Amen. It's her actions proved that she believed there was something different about Jesus. And that, that was many at the time of Jesus, many around Jesus. Not necessarily his followers, not necessarily the the nation that he came for, but even foreigners drew to him, believing something greater, that Jesus was greater than what other people perceived about him. And when we come to church, we gather together corporate, we come together to encourage each other, but we're driven by faith to come here, to not just empower ourselves, but God to use us to impact other people's lives. You can make the difference in many people's lives if you start believing God, taking God at his full word. And we're going to explore this this evening, some aspects of that this evening, laying the foundation. Amen. Praise God. And the psalmist tells us, Psalm 111 verse 10 says this. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all those who do his commandments. His praise endures forever. He says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Uh, what does, what, how do we translate this? How do we interpret this? You only fear that which you believe is, exists. Yeah? If you, you're not going to fear something that you don't believe exists. And so when you start fearing God, when I say fearing, there's many different layers, many different interpretations of this type of fear. The, the, the Hebrew word for fear also means reverence. The reverence of God is the beginning of wisdom, meaning you acknowledge he's there and you reverence him, you respect him. Praise God. You can also have a a healthy fear. If you love something, you fear that you're going to lose it. People fear losing their material wealth because they love their material wealth. And they put their trust and belief in their material wealth. And when it's taken away from them, pulled from under their feet, they're left empty, broken, desolate. 
And that's the type of fear we should have direct towards God, that we don't want God to leave our lives because then we'll be empty, we'll, we'll, we'll be desolate, we'll be broken. And so we need to have that healthy fear in, in God. And it covers many, many, many areas of our being, or body, soul, and spirit, praise God. Hallelujah. So the, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So we only fear that which we believe exists, praise God. Amen. In Romans chapter 4, we're going to touch upon the life of Abraham that becomes Abraham. But it tells us, uh, but Abraham's faith qualified him to be a friend of God, and it was accounted as righteousness unto him. Yeah, because he believed God, not just believed, but trusted God and followed his leading. Yeah, and this is Romans chapter 4, verse 3 says this For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him as righteousness. Yeah, so your faith in God, when I say believe in God, believe with your actions, not just your words. If I call for a team to go to evangelize, at the end of the day, it shows do we really want to reach out or are we just going to just stay in our comfort zones, praise God. And James chapter 2 verse 23 says this, and the scripture was fulfilled, which says Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness and he was called the friend of God. Hallelujah, praise God. And this is also taken from Second Chronicles chapter 20 verse 7, watch this, what it says here. Are you not our God? And drove out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and gave it to your descendants of Abraham, your friend forever. Wow. God's friendship and love to you is not temporal. It's not a one night occasion. It's forever. And it's, it, it has to be reciprocated. God's friendship must be reciprocated by you. We love him because he first loved us. And in fact, the Greek translators of the Hebrew put it in a slightly different way. They don't say, for example, that um, uh, your, your friend forever. They say the one God loved forever. Igabisen, the Greek word is igabisen, not philos. Meaning he loved and that love is unconditional, and that love is eternal, and that love is given. That's why he blessed Abraham above everyone else. He said, I'll bless those who bless you, and I'll curse him who curses you. Why? Because of his faith toward God unto God, and his obedience to God to follow him. Even though he didn't know the destination he was going to, he still trusted God. When we start... Acknowledging the reality of God and that we're eternal, we're, we're created for eternity and that we're, there's a purpose to our life. Our purpose is not menial, just getting up in the morning, going to work, going home, getting up in the morning, going to work, going on a little vacation, holiday, coming back, going to work, getting up in the morning. That's not what it's all about. You're created for something greater beyond yourself. But the mechanism wants to limit you and say that's all it is and that's all you're going to get out of life. But God has so much more for you. And this is why they didn't want Jesus because Jesus came to bring the window and the door to show us the eternal purpose we were created for in his his image and his likeness Amen. and that everything the possibilities of Jesus that he can do we have the capability to do follow his example he says greater works than me you will do Amen. but we don't believe it because we want to be religious we want half an hour service on Sunday go home happy clappy go home uh, Sunday rolls back to the old grind and God is beyond more than that God is a way of life God is life it's not we're looking for the answers. He is the answer. Yeah. Harley, I wish I'm speaking to someone today because God has a message this weekend. It's a game changer. Some people, if you're watching this and if you've seen after this weekend, your whole complete perception of the Bible and the outlook and God is going to be transformed. I'm telling you that. It's a game changer. Yeah. Unless you come like a sif, unless you come closed, you won't, re you, you, you won't receive. But if you open, you will receive. There's no... You're going to receive, whether you like it or not, you will receive what God has for you. Praise God. Hallelujah. So if you want to be a friend of God forever, and you want to love that reality of God's love, you've got to follow the example of the Word of God. 
God does not make it up as he goes along. God's planned it already. He has the blueprint to bring that about because he said the, the Lamb of God that was slain went from the foundation of the world, meaning he made provision. He made the plan for us to be blessed, for us to be successful, to us to be overcomers, to us to be more than It's already been given to us. We've got to walk into that reality and trust him and trust, take God at his word. We trust everyone else but God. Hallelujah. So let me take a, an example of Abraham's faith from um, Genesis chapter 22. Let's explore this for a few moments and see where this gets us, praise God, which is powerful but very profound. Hallelujah. In Genesis chapter 22, verse 1, you know God called Abraham. We read from, say, chapter the end of chapter 11 and, and chapter 12 of Genesis. We begin the journey, the encounter, the phallic encounter of Abra Abraham at that time before he becomes Abraham. Because it's, it's a progressive science. What you do determines outcomes. If you want God to use you in a powerful way, let, be used in the small things. Be fulfilled, honor God in the small things that he'll bless you for, with greater things. But if you're not faithful in the small things, why is he going to give you greater responsibilities, praise God? When I began my ministry, I spoke to six people. But I wanted to be faithful with the six people. And those six people are still in the ministry. And therefore, take me to the point now, I was speaking to over 150,000 people in different parts of the world through the media and things. And it's not the numbers that I'm concerned about. It's about fulfilling the will and purpose of God in my life. And that's our desire. That should be what's important for us, to fulfill God's purpose in our lives. That's Either it's to speak to one person or a billion people. It doesn't matter. As long as God is in the equation that we're doing what we're supposed to do. Amen. You know the light bulb in the room? You have these lights here. When you go home, you have a singular light in your room, maybe your, your lounge or your kitchen or a few lights there in your kitchen. The light doesn't shine more when there's 50 people in or where there's one person. The light will shine the same if there's one person in a room and the same it will shine if there's 50 people in your room. We shine the same whether we're speaking to a 1,000 people or whether we're speaking to one people. That light in us must illuminate our surroundings, our environment because it comes from with us. People want a big audience to preach the gospel. We want to be faithful to God. As long as God and the angels are there, we, we are the majority. So Abraham had his beginning. You've got your beginning. And we've got to be faithful to God in the small things as well as the big things. But if you cannot be faithful in the small things, forget about the big things. They'll trip you up. Hallelujah. It's some small things that show what we truly are. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. It's small beginnings. There's consequences of small things. And we've got to be faithful in those small things. So he begins, so he takes a journey. His journey, uh, Abra Abraham's journey was characterized by challenges. We're the same as you and I. We have challenges in our lives. We have people doubting us. We have people hating on us. We have people criticizing us. We, we, we lose an employment. We get another employment. We, we have, we're going through all roller coasters of emotions and challenges in our lives. Emotional, economical, relationship. We have all these things going on all the time. But we've got to be steadfast and we've got to be focused on God. We need to stand on our faith and trust in God above all these things that come to still our relationship first with God. And with each other. And it came to a point that when God's speaking to Abraham, speaking to Sarah, his wife, uh, uh, Sarai then becomes Sarah. Their names change because there's a change in God. God forms you. God transforms you. God empowers you. But it's through the journey that we grow and mature in things of God. That we look beyond our limitations, praise God. Hallelujah. And it came to a point in time God promised Abraham and there, he ran ahead, and we know the story with Hagar and Ishmael. I'm not going to touch upon that because I want to take, come to a point, chapter 22, where God, he has his promise. He feels he's content with the promise coming to him, which is Isaac, because God told him Isaac is the one, not, not, not Ishmael. He was content with his life. He's got everything he wants. He's got his riches. He's got his livestock. He's got his servants. I mean, it was when, when Lot became a captive in Sodom and Gomorrah, what had happened, he, he took servants from his, from born in his own household, 318 servants. So he had a massive troop around him. He had an army around him. And he was content. He could sit back and enjoy his success. But God said to him at the point where he felt everything was fine, he was crossing the T's and dots in the I's, and everything found its place and its level. God said, I want you to do something for me, Abraham, now. He said, I want you to, you know your son, 
your heir, I want you to sacrifice him for me. I want you to take him somewhere and sacrifice him for me. Can you imagine what was processed? And I often preachers over preach this sermon, this, this passage of scripture. I want us to think a few things about what this represents, this, the implications of this. You got, you got your prized possession, the thing you worked all your life for. He was 100 years old when, when he had his son Isaac. He waited a long time for the promise. And now no sooner the promise comes, but God is saying, I'm taking this promise away from you. He's saying, what you treasure, the, mo- the thing you treasure more than anything, the thing is mo- most important to you. I want to take it away. What, is your, what do you treasure more in the most important thing in your life? It might be your car. It might be your job. It might be your career. It might be a partner, a relative. It might be a, a, a something. What, what is it that we treasure more? in our lives, and God is saying at this moment, I want to take it from you. I'm going to cause you to become bankrupt in yourself because the foundation you're standing on is going to destroy you forever if you don't deal with it. And sometimes there's things in us that God wants to deal with, and we don't understand that. So it takes us through a roller coaster, roller coaster of challenge to bring us to reality that where we think we are, we're in the wrong place. We shouldn't be where we think we are. God wants to take us somewhere different. Yeah? So... Let me, let me read the narrative. We, we, we'll explain a few things in the journey here because the, the, the narrative has different layers to it. It's, it's metaphorical. It's allegorical. It's a foreshadow. It's a prefigurement. It's a prophecy, but it's a personal experience. Because when God wants to use you to speak to other people's lives, you, before you share the message, you have to learn the message, the lesson yourselves. God will not tell you to teach a lesson unless you've got the scars of that lesson represent. Unless that lesson is written in scars in your life, you're not qualified to speak that message to other people. Before Jesus can speak of love, he had to be loved. Before he started teaching forgiveness, he had to demonstrate forgiveness with, the, with the, the, the nail prints in his palms and in his feet. Because you cannot teach about forgiveness unless you understand what forgiveness is in yourself. So we come to the point, chapter 22, and bear in mind, Isaac is not a child. Scholars and time uh, chronologi- chronologically and, and historically, uh, the rabbinical tradition and the Christian church tradition put, put Isaac's age at around uh, 30 years old, approximately 30, over 30. He wasn't a child. He was, he, he was able to communicate with his father and ask questions with him. It wasn't a baby that had no choice in the matter. He followed him willingly. So let's take this little journey. So for people watching at home, please take this journey because there's an Isaac we've got to deal with in our lives sometimes. <clears throat> Whatever that Isaac represents. <clears throat> because we feel we're, the, we feel we're, we're grown, we're spiritual, but when we're sideswiped with God's challenge to take something away from us, we become very, you know, uh, agitated, very, very uncomfortable. And we change have you seen the film? I don't know if the book is a book called Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. I think it was written about some people come to church. When someone gives you the, 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 the cocktail of a challenge, you change, you metamorphosis. But we need to metamorphosis on the mountain of transfiguration with Jesus, not like the world does. So we need, to, we need to let Christ be established in us. That makes a difference. Watch this. Now it came to pass after, after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. Then he said, take now your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains which I, I shall tell you. So it's all right. All the time in, in, in Abraham's life, all the time God was speaking to him, but never told him that directly. He said, start the journey, and I'll tell you in the course of the journey where you should be. He didn't say, well, you know, this is, he didn't have a, a sat-nav or a ways or whatever these are, navigation to give him the play, program, this is where you're going to go. He had to work, he had to follow, he had to trust God even in the journey. 
He didn't have the map with the point, this is where you're going to be. He says, just start the journey to the, to the mountains of Moriah. And as you're going there, I will show you where you're going to be. Now, Abraham is oblivious at this moment what the whole purpose of this journey is about. He perhaps thinks he's going to go for a walk with the Lord and have a dialogue, a theological deep dialogue, where exploring the meaning of life, but he doesn't know what's about to hit him. And he says, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah. And offer him, and after, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I should tell you. I will tell you the mountain. What? Hold this. I missed, the, I missed the first part. Yeah, I'm going to go. I missed it. Can you just say that again, God? What, what? I cannot comprehend. This is the air. This is the blessing. This is what I strive for all my life. This job that I've got now, I put all my trust in my job, in my work. This, 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 this house I have, I've saved so much to, to, to possess. This car that I, I love so much. You know, I've worked so hard for this. I'm taking it from you. I want you to give it to me. And... So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled the don his donkey, and took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son, and he split the wood for the burnt offering, and rose and went to the place of which God had told him. So he's, he doesn't, there's, there's no response, he's just following the Lord's lead. Walking by faith and not by sight. Amen. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. So after a three-day journey, he looks up and he sees the place that God had taken. God was directing him to go. And Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship and we will come back to you. Now something going on in, in Abraham's life on a different layer. There's a subscript, something more deeper going on there. He... He's trusting in God that God is the author of life, the God of the living, not the God of the dead. And he realizes that if God's doing something, it's got to be an outcome, but in his favor. Because he knows the nature and the character of the God he serves. When we know the God we serve, we know that if something's taken away, there's something better for us. But we put all our trust in what we have and we excel for the good or the not so good, when God has the best for us. And if God's going to take something away, he's going to, he's going to replace it with something far superior than what he's going to take from you, because what he's taking from you is limiting you, and what he's going to give you is going to unlimit you in power, in spiritual power. I wish I was speaking to someone. And so, so he, he says we're going to go and worship, and we're going to come back. They weren't going to, they were not sightseers. In the mountains of Moriah. They're there to worship God. And wherever we are, the rule of thumb is always praise and worship God. Wherever you are. Okay. So it says they're going to go. Meaning they're going to really surrender to God. The Greek word is the only word that's applied to God in the New Testament. There's sevome, latrevo, timo, and proskinesis. Proskinesis is the only word that's directed to God. And that's what the devil wanted. He wanted Jesus to proskini say him and, and, and serve him. And Jesus says, you only worship God, our, the Lord, our God, the, your God. And the thing is this, is that when they were going to worship proskini say Peter, he rejected it. When, they're going to, when John was going to worship proskini say the angel, he rejected it. But Jesus accepted it to show who he was, praise God. So they were saying, we're going to go and worship, but we're coming back. I know between going, there's something going to happen and we're going to come back. I know I've got the sacrifice. I know physically I see the evidence of a sacrifice of a death. But I know my God is the God of the living and not the God of the dead. And if so, whatever's going to happen, we're going to return more powerful, greater than ever before, praise God. Watch the move of God. I've seen God move, Abraham's saying. Hallelujah. I've seen him move through my life. So I know the God that I serve. 
That if he's asked for something, he's got something greater for me. So I'm going to trust him more than I trust myself. Hallelujah. I wish I'm speaking to someone. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife. And the two of them went together. All these elements point to speak of a a great event that will take place centuries later. And because the area they went to, God directed uh, Abraham to, was this area. I've got a map for you out there. I want to show you the area he, he took him. If we can put it on the overhead very quickly. Right. Can you make it bigger? You see where he took him? The Mount Moriah. You see where is it? Where is it? Jerusalem. He took Isaac to Jerusalem. Where was Jesus crucified? Jerusalem. Hallelujah. That's where he took Isaac. And not only took him to Jerusalem, he took some elements that will represent, fulfill the prophecy. Because Jesus said, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And he saw it and he was glad. And they said to him, you're not yet 50 years old that you have seen Abraham. He says, before Abraham was, I am. I preceded Abraham. I'm the one who spoke to Abraham. I'm the one who was in the bush, caught in the thickets of the bush. Hallelujah. I was there. Now watch this. Watch what happens here. Watch what happens here. And so here we're told that Abraham took the wood. The Greek word used here in the Septuagint for wood is xylon or xyla. Wood, xylon. The same word that is used for the tree of life in the Garden of Eden. The xylon. Because Jesus was crucified on the xylon. He was crucified on the xylon. The, 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 it says, cursed is anyone who hangs on the xylon. The xylon. He could have used another substitute, substitute word for a tree. But he used the same word that was recorded in Genesis in relation to the tree of life and the tree of knowledge and good and evil. Because when Jesus was crucified, the two trees were there at the simultaneously at the same time in the same place. The tree, the cross of Calvary is a representation of the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Because Jesus takes the curse upon himself. Amen. So Genesis chapter 22 verse 6 aligns with Genesis chapter 2 verse 9. Let me just quickly go there very quickly. If you want to make your notes and watch it back on the, on the archives, please feel free to do so. And out of the ground, the Lord God made every tree. Rise it up, please. Every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of, of the garden. And the tree of, of the knowledge of good and evil, they were both there at the same place at the same time. And in the Greek, if you highlight the word for xylon, it says xylon, the next one down please. Vrosinge doxylon dizois, the tree of life was there. So you see that's an element. So Christ is crucified on the xylon. Right, And we see that Abraham takes the xylon with Isaac, the element that fulfills the crucifixion. But not only that, it has also, it says, Isaac, his son, and he took the fire. He had the beer. The word beer in Greek is a representation of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was at the cross of Calvary at the same time, I wish, because God is a consuming fire. Hallelujah. See, if you look, if you, I, I want to qualify this before we move on. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 29 says this. Gerar o theos imon, pir katana liskon, a consuming fire. Hallelujah. God. Oh, it doesn't stop there. It doesn't finish there. And then what does he have here? Fire in his hand. And a knife. And he has a knife. Well, the Apostle Paul tells us when we wrestle against principalities, rulers of darkness, and powers of darkness, we need, he says, we need a sword. This Greek word is the same word that Paul uses for the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Because the Word of God was there at that time when, when, when Abraham was going to offer his son Isaac as a, cruc- as, a, as a sacrifice. I wish I'm speaking to someone. In, in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17, watch what it says here. Come on, I'm I'm giving you depth here, width and length and height, because we want to come back to ourselves. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit. Let me just say, Gedin Perigefalean du Soderiu 
δεξάστε και την μάχεραν. The word μάχεραν is the same Greek word that is used for the knife that Abraham was going to use to sacrifice Isaac. I wish I'm speaking to some. Let me go to, let me go to Genesis chapter 22, verse 6. I'll show you in the Greek very quickly so you can see exactly the same word, spelled exactly the same way. It says here, Macheran, the last, go to the first down, that's it. Macheran, the, the, the sword or the knife, it's actually the sword of the Spirit. So all the elements of crucifixion are there, praise God, hallelujah. And so we see this a prefigurement, a foreshadow of what's take, going to take place centuries later in the life of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, where the, the Lord intervenes for Abraham and Isaac. God does not spare his son. He allows him to go through the crucifixion to redeem and reconcile each one of us back to himself from where we had fallen to be restored and greater than ever before in the power of the Holy Spirit. I wish I'm speaking to some. And chapter 7, Genesis 22, 7. But Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father. See, there was a dialogue. He was a little child, an infant. He was a grown man. And it said... My father. And he said, here I am, my son. Then he said, look, the fire, the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, my son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. And Abraham was speaking prophetically without even knowing it. Because the answer to this question was not answered by Abraham. It was answered by John the Baptist when he saw Jesus Christ. Because in John chapter 1 verse 29, this is what John states. This is what John proclaims. He says this. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Hallelujah. Praise God. And this is, this is what we are looking at, we are contending with. The word of God that's so real. You cannot make this up as you go along. And where was it? Jerusalem. Moriah, Jerusalem. And that's why he was centered there. That's, what, that's why Jesus proclaimed it to the Jews, said, Abraham. He says, I'll destroy this, this temple and rebuild it in three days. They couldn't understand what he's speaking about. It's only in the spirit we can understand what's truly taking place. Hallelujah. Then verse 9, very quickly. Then they came to the place of which God had told him. And Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in, in order. And he bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. What happened to Jesus? He was laid upon the wood, the cross of Calvary. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. He took the word, hallelujah, to allow that word to be fulfilled. But the angel of the Lord called to him, from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, here I am. And he said, do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and there behind him was a ram caught in the thicket by its horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. And Abraham called the name of the place, The Lord will provide. Yahweh Jireh. The Lord will provide. Hallelujah. I mean, and also another word, another interpretation of that, of Yahweh Jireh is Yahweh sees. God sees everything. We're not, we cannot hide anything from God. God sees our beginning. He sees our end. He sees everything we do. He sees our attitude. There's nothing can be held back from what God can see in our lives. He knows whether we're genuine. He knows whether we're fake. Hallelujah. In this world, so used to fakeness, you can't tell the truth from a lie. But he knows the truth, and it's the truth that sets us free. Praise God. Hallelujah. Then verse 15 says this, Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time out of heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing. You have not withheld your son, your only son. Blessing, blessing I will bless you. And multiplying, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heavens and as the sand which is on the seashore. And your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. Praise God. Because of Abraham's blessing, other people are the beneficiaries of his obedience. Because of your obedience and your blessings, other people can be blessed because your obedience to God. 
is powerful. It's a, it's a spiritual uh, science, if you like. If you do what God says, you're going to have the godly outcome, praise God. And again, Mo, uh, Abraham's life was characterized by blessings from the beginning and continually God was blessing him. Why? Because even with his shortfalls, even with his failings, he still leaned and trusted God in the way forward. He accepted his errors and he trusted God and followed his leading, praise God. He was selfless in himself in that respect. And that's what we're called to follow their examples, the patriarchs' examples, because the beginning of Abraham's journey was blessing. And not only blessing for himself, but blessing for people around, around him. I wish I'm speaking. You're going to get this when you get home. Go back and re regurgitate the word because you're going to see the power that's embodied in, the, in this passage and in these words that we're sharing this evening. Let me say something to you. He said in Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, watch how it's structured. Watch this carefully. I will bless those who bless you. For those who have the Abra Abrahamic mentality will understand what I'm speaking about. I will bless those who bless you. When you are blessed, when someone blesses you in the house of God, when someone blesses you, either in any shape or form, materially, through, through, through uh, supporting you, through praying for you, through whatever they're doing, that, that blessing comes back a hundredfold on them. He said that the script, Jesus said, Whoever gives you a glass of water in the name of, of me, or in the name of Jesus, he, they will by no means lose their reward. Whatever's done unto you as children of God, they become beneficiaries of blessing. God blesses them. But people don't understand these principles. That's why there's so much impoverished in the world. It's falling apart. People don't understand that principle. Hallelujah, praise God. And so I bless those who bless you and curse those who cur and curse him who curses you. So there's a blessing flows from the Abrahamic mentality. And then we find here at the end it says, blessings I will bless you. Why? What, what facilitates this blessing? Obedience. Faith. Let me qualify. I've still got a few things I want to share before you go. Deuteronomy chapter 28 verse 1 says obedience. In fact, the scripture tells us obedience is better than sacrifice. Deuteronomy chapter 28 verse 1 says this. Now it shall come to pass, if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God, to observe carefully all his commandments, which I command you today, that the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. God will make you head and shoulders above everything else, whatever those nations represent. Verse 2. And all these blessings should come upon you and overtake you because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. You want to be, we say we want blessing. We want health. We want well-being. Obey God. When your praises go up, the blessings come down. When you're obedient to God, God is bound. He has a legal obligation to bless you it has to come if you're genuine with your prayers you're genuine you're genuine with your obedience god will bless you praise god he says in your seed verse 20 verse 8 um, it's verse 18 in your seed all the nations of the earth should be blessed because you have obeyed my voice when we're obedient to god obedient to god not obedient to our friends not obedient to our own imagination, but obedient to God. Okay, watch this. Because you obeyed me, he says, as a result of obe obeying me, other people are going to be blessed because you have obeyed me. Do you want other people to be blessed? No, our generation is selfishness. We want to get all the blessing. Never mind the others. We don't care about the others. I want to get the blessing. But if you want to get the blessing, you have to follow God's guidelines. It, it's, it's scientific. I can't... I can't cut corners and I cannot um, uh, neglect certain details. It will not happen. The universe, the, the planets rotate in their orbit 
One comes out of sync, just a few, uh, a few centimeters, whatever, a few inches, whatever the case is. There's going to be chaos. And if we're obedient to God, he will do his part. All we need to do is do our part. Praise God. Hallelujah. We're obedient in spite and not because. I'll pray I'm speaking to someone today because it's important to be to focus on, on your journey personally. Because when you come, be, last week I showed, the, or the week before, when did I show the cross and hell? When did I show that? Week before? Last Sunday. Was it last Sunday? Two, two Sundays. Look, time flies. It's like Groundhog Day. Things like, I, I'm here all the time. I don't know what happens. But uh, yes. But when I showed that, I said, look, everyone's going to come to God in their own steed. My best friends cannot stand before that throne with me. I, ca- I have to account for myself and what example I've given and how I have lived myself. Praise God. That's what's important. It, it, whatever other people do, they've got to, they, it says, work out your fear and tre- work out your salvation for fear and trembling. Personally, you cannot save me. I cannot save you. Hallelujah, praise God. And there's a responsibility that comes with our faith. Amen. So the, uh, obedience is better than sacrifice. And so it's God's will in that. Sometimes we want to do something. And, and I'm really prayerful, really mindful, because my role, my responsibility is very demanding. I have to really prioritize and seek God's guidance, where, what I should do, what I shouldn't do. Uh, what I should support, what I shouldn't be supporting. It's not just get up in the morning, anything goes. There's a lot of prayer goes behind my role and my responsibility. Because I'm accountable for all of you and anyone I minister, I'm accountable. And I'm always mindful of that. And I want to make sure that what I preach is what God wants, not my emotions. And, and we, we start speaking on emotions, forget about it, you've lost the plot. We're body, soul and spirit, praise God. So we have to be very prayerful and reflective what we're doing. And we need to be sincere and genuine about our faith. And that's why Jesus showed this example. He says, like, the natural man does not understand the things of the spirit. They are foolishness to him. And that's why Jesus in the natural, he limited himself to the point where he had a, a divine ignorance, if you like. Because he, he says, even the son of man does not know the end time. Only the father so that's the emptying of Jesus. He, 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 he identified with us in every way, with the pain, with the limitations. And that's when the Garden of Gethsemane, he said, Father, if it's possible, take this cup away from me. But not my will, thy will be done. Because God will take you places that you won't be able to, and give you experiences and, and encounter challenges that you won't be able to naturally process with your natural mind. And that's where faith has to kick in. And that's sometimes all you'll have to hold on to. But if you break through, if you hold on, you'll get breakthrough and you'll be better for it. You'll see the purpose, the reason behind it. When Joseph was sold by his brethren into slavery, when they wanted to kill him, he couldn't understand. He had the vision. He had the dreams, I should say. God has spoken to him. He was blessed. God told him his brothers will bow down before him. The sun and moon and his mother and father will, will honor him. He couldn't, he couldn't make sense of the fact that his brothers hated him and they sold him into slavery. But at the end, he realized through the journey that what they meant for evil, God meant it for good. The key is to hold on till you get to that place of that realization. And the church is the vehicle and the vessel to bring that reality to you, to encourage you to persevere and to not give up. Because it's easy to give up in the face of adversity. There was times I was standing to minister in my life where all that was holding me up was my faith. And I'm, I'm, not, I'm not dramatizing things. That is a reality. When everything came against me and I was, I was having the adversity battles and all I had was a, a little faith and that's what held me and people were well, none the wiser because I was trusting God. Amen. And I said, I'm holding on. Come hell or high water. Amen. So persevere, I'm saying to you, prepare for the weekend. Because God's got game changers for us, a game changer that we need to embrace and know there is a true living God. There is a God. There is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. There is the Lord of glory. There is the Alpha and Omega. He is the Lord. 
He was and is and will always be. Hallelujah. And his name is Jesus Christ. Praise God. Hallelujah. Let's just finish with the last few thoughts and about obedience. When John the Baptist encountered Jesus, he said he, he, he made a statement to Jesus. He said, look, far be it from me to baptize you. I'm not even worthy to loosen the sound, your stand straps of your, or, uh, on your feet, and sandals on your feet. And he said, permit this also to take place, that we fulfill all righteousness. Meaning obedience is righteousness. Obey God is righteousness. And Jesus' conclusion, I'm going to just conclude the last few thoughts. And when Jesus was inviting the disciples to follow him, he wasn't dragging them, kicking and screaming. He invited them. He invites us. God never pulled me by force to serve his purpose. And the one statement Jesus made that sometimes we lose sight of is in Matthew chapter 16, verse 24. This is what he says here. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. And this is the attitude that Abraham had. He denied himself. He said three things. These are the three things, the giants in our lives. In the coming weeks, I'll speak about the giants. Not just the giant that David over, overtook and killed Goliath. I want to speak about the giants in our lives that sometimes are the biggest hindrances to stop us progressing. Look what the giants that Abraham, God told Abraham to deal with. And that comes in the denial of Jesus because it's these giants that God wants us to deny ourselves, for, deny to be able to follow him. And we need sometimes faith, if not all the time, to be able to accomplish that. But if you want your faith to grow, this is the last verse for this evening to think about. This is Romans chapter 10, verse 17. This is what it says here. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Let's say it together. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And let me say you at all times, the reason that God sometimes challenges us is because he loves us. Your children... And your family, if you love someone, you won't let them harm themselves. You try and prevent them from harming themselves. You wouldn't let your child do something that would jeopardize, compromise their safety and their well-being. Would you? Would you let them go somewhere where you think they're going to get knocked over by a car or or something's going to happen to them that's going to be fatal? You wouldn't allow that, would you? Well, why would God? When the the parallel, truth is parallel, there's a spiritual dangers around and we've got to be careful. So let's give the Lord the praise, the glory, and the worship tonight. Be ready for the weekend. Fasten your seatbelts because the ride is going to go very quite upside down, inside out. You know these roller coasters that turn you on your head?